I'm, I'm going to talk primarily today about uh, trends that I see in novels. Um, I'm not going to presume that any of you have read any of the novels that I'm going to talk about. Hopefully there'll be enough information within the talk so that you can follow along even if you haven't read these novels. Um, let me tell you specifically what kind of novels that I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to be talking about what I'll call entertainments like um, John Grisham. Do you guys know John Grisham? Um, or maybe Tom Clancy, or maybe Danielle Steele. I'll call those entertainments, and they're very fun. I read those. Um, I'm not going to be talking about fantasies like Harry Potter. Also, wonderful, but I'm not going to be talking about them. So I'm going to confine myself to novels that I might call artistic novels or high art novels. Now, that's not like an official genre. That's I just made that up. Um, but I think that you probably know what sort of novels that I'm talking about when I say high art novels. Novels do something that almost no other genre does. Um, novels demand a sort of cooperation between the reader and the writer. And that cooperation is something like when we read a novel, especially a novel that is not primarily driven by action, but by the inner movement of characters, we enter inside that inner action. We kind of track along with those characters. So if movies and Netflix, they primarily kind of beckon to us through the eye, and the characters are always up there on the screen, there's always a kind of like a, a fairly significant separation between me and those people up there. Now, of course, I enter into their experience in some way. When Batman is you know, battling the Joker, I enter into his experience in some way. But I, I think that the novel demands a kind of closer proximity between me and the protagonist. This is not any, like, any major claim that I'm making. I'm just kind of trying to orient us. Novels also are um, special in that they address social eras. They address social eras and they plant characters within big changes, big movements within eras. So I like see the novel as traveling in trends just like every other art form travels in trends. So if you look back at novels of the 19th century, there's a couple of trends, a couple of kind of preoccupations among novelists. One of them is marriage. Um, and so if you have read maybe Anna Karenina or if you have read um, Madame Bovary, both of these novels, and they are wonderful, wonderful books, are really addressing this question that was a big preoccupation in the middle, late 19th century, which is women are becoming more empowered socially, they're becoming more empowered politically. Now, what does this mean for domestic life? What does this mean for couples? What does this mean for the institution of marriage? And so in Anna Karenina, when Anna has an affair with Vronsky, it's not just a little bedroom squabble between he her and her husband. It's of massive social import. It's a, the ripples kind of like spread out across, um, across Russia. Same thing with Madame Bovary. There's another trend in the 19th century, which I'll call um, the urban plot. So if you know Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens is really preoccupied with what is happening inside of major cities because of the Industrial Revolution that's happening. Um, David Crabtree in this room, I heard him say very frequently, it's hard to overestimate the effect that Industrial Revolution had upon Western civilization. You almost can't exaggerate it. He's exactly right. And novels, accordingly, at that time, many of them were really preoccupied with what exactly is going to happen to society now that all of these people that used to live an agrarian kind of life, whose lives were shaped by the rising and the setting of the sun, now they're coming into the city, and now their lives are shaped by a whistle that's pulled by the foreman at unnatural hours. It's not just like when the sun rises and the sun sets, but it's whenever the foreman decides. And so uh, the world becomes much more mechanized. 
And so novels of that era, Dickens, um, maybe you have read Theodore Dreisler's Sister Carrie, a, a classic novel of that period. It's the story of a girl who grows up in um, rural Wisconsin. She moves to Chicago, and everything about her life changes. It's a wonderful novel. It doesn't really have as much of a reputation as it did maybe 50 years ago, but I recommend it. It's really delightful. So novels are often not really given as much credit for their effect to shape culture as I think that they deserve, and I think part of the reason why is um, what do you say when a novel really affects you? It's hard to describe what exactly that change is. It almost feels like it's a change on like the cellular level more than it's like my mind change. So I can, I can read an essay on a political issue and I can say at the end of the essay if it's really compelling, I change my mind about this political issue. But it's, we don't really say that about a novel because I, and I, and my conviction is because like, well, the change is actually much deeper than just a change of one's mind. It's because you kind of get inside the skin of somebody who is going through the effects of the Industrial Revolution or whose marriage is breaking up and it changes you in ways I think that are just deeper than the change of a, posi a mental position or a political conviction or a philosophical conviction. Uh, Karl Marx believed that Charles Dickens' novels, this is a quote, issued to the world more political and social truths than have been uttered by all the professional, political, publicists, and moralists put together. And I think he's probably right. We don't think of Charles Dickens as like a philosopher. We don't really think of him, maybe we, maybe we do think of him as um, a culture shaper. But I don't think we typically give him enough um, credit for that. So that being said, I think like the possibilities of the novel like really affecting us very deeply and really affecting culture in ways that are very hard to articulate, um, they're there. So I want to talk about the trend that I see in the contemporary novel. If the 19th century was really concerned about what's going to happen to the institution of marriage, what's going to happen because of this industrial revolution that we're all enduring, I'm going to talk about like the trend that I see over and over and over and over in novels that have been written, especially since World War I. So what I'm calling con a contemporary novel is a novel that was written in the last roughly 100 years, which you might quibble with my um, definition of contemporary, but let it be for the time being. The trend today, let me first qualify it by saying, um, I taught at Gutenberg for 10 years. Charlie Dewberry, our academic dean, was kind enough to kind of give me a lot of literature. I think I just, I lean in that direction. I've been doing a podcast for about four years that's almost exclusively about novels. We do some plays. Most of the novels that we do are contemporary novels. So I, I, you might call me like an amateur professional or a professional amateur when it comes to literary criticism. I'm one or the other. All that to say, I've been kind of paying close attention to what is happening among novelists. Here's what I think. Since World War I, the most decorated novelists have gravitated in their most decorated works toward the theme of decay. From F. Scott Fitzgerald to Evelyn Waugh to Cormac McCarthy, both religious and irreligious, irreligious novelists alike incline to believe that the civilized world is in some form of decay, that the once solid foundation that seemed to undergird civilization now appears to be in a state of decline and decay. I'll just give you a handful of, re a handful of um, novels that I think kind of are emblematic of this. Uh, I'll start with the one that most of you know. You probably read it in high school, The Great Gatsby, published six years after World War, after the end of World War I. It's on the short list for the great American novel, and it tells the story of Nick Carraway, a veteran of the Great War, World War I, who meets Jay Gatsby and is kind of swept along into Gatsby's circle of decadence and ruin. We drove on toward death through the cooling twilight. It's a novel 
that kind of questions the, the progress or the kind of upward movement of the of American life, of the American dream. A second novel, Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. Who's read it? Anybody read it? Published in 1945, Newsweek listed it as one of the top 100 books in world literature, and it tells the story of Charles Ryder who longs for the atmosphere of a better age and of the grandeur of Catholicism, but Charles can't quite achieve either of them. It is a beautiful book that ends with a longing for something that just can't seem to be regained. Though you can see it in Charles's character, he's a painter, he's a very, becomes a very accomplished painter, and he just seems to be constantly yearning for this, this glimpse of a world that he wasn't a part of, that he knows is going away, that he knows is being kind of replaced by a sort of technocracy of the United States kind of becoming the grand power in the world which he loathes, and he, he yearns for this time when England, this kind of like aristocratic life was still accessible to him. But I, I see it as a novel of decay, preoccupied with loss. A third novel, 1963, The Spy Who Came In From the Cold by John Le Carre, one of Time Magazine's top 100 novels of all time, depicts Alec Leamus, a British agent who comes to see that Western espionage methods are morally inconsistent with Western democracy and values. Again, it's a story of loss. We hoped that we were protecting something good, but we're losing this good thing. The, the kind of work that we're employed in as spies cannot be reconciled with these other high values that we have of democracy and, and liberal values. 1989, Remains of the Day, a novel by Kazuo Ishiguro, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Ishiguro won the Nobel Prize in Literature, not this particular book, though I think it's his best. It tells the story of a British butler, Mr. Stevens, who's watching the great house of Lord Darlington grow corrupted as Lord Darlington grows sympathetic with the Nazis. Mr. Stevens, um, is watching, it's, it's like he's almost watching the aristocracy of England shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And all of those values shrink along with the size of the household that he's minding. Fifth book, last one that I'll mention is The Road by Cormac McCarthy, which won the Pulitzer in 2006, which tells the story of, the, of a father and son trying to survive a post-apocalyptic landscape. And I think it's really telling, how many of you have read The Road? I think it's really telling that the most frightening thing in The Road is not the decay of technology and all of the kind of like accoutrements of modern life. It's human beings chasing the father and son. They're terrifying. It's the human beings that are terrifying. It's not the tech, it's like not the loss of technology that's so terrifying. That's just kind of the backdrop. So, let me first say, let me, let me give a little rejoinder so I can be a little bit more specific about what I mean about decay. Um, in some ways, we live in the most ordered society that human beings have ever seen, like time 10. Our trains run on time, our cars start. Um, the electricity in my writer's cottage was out last night and it was like, <laughs> I was like, when was the last time that I've not had electricity? I can't even remember the last time that I didn't have electricity. And so I, and when was the last time I didn't have hot water and internet? I can't even remember the last time I didn't have hot water and internet. So the sort of decay that I'm talking about, and I, and I sus suspect your experience is pretty similar, to kind of like leave the habits and trustworthiness of modern infrastructure, you would have to make a decision. You'd have to get in a car and you'd have to drive somewhere very deliberately to get away from like all of these s comforts that we can all count on, right? So the decay that I'm talking about is not a decay of technology. It's not a decay of infrastructure. It's a human kind of culture decay. It's, dec it's a decay of um, those things that we probably consider the most important things to us that kind of operate within the technology that we take for granted 
And there are things like our spiritual state. Almost every single one of these authors, though not all of them were Christian, all of them seem to be very preoccupied with like, kind of like this sense of spiritual decay, this sense of relational decay, this sense of cultural decay. We're losing something. They describe it in different ways. Sometimes it's kind of almost seems kind of ineffable, but still we're losing something. So that's the decay that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about um, an apocalyptic, even though the road is an apocalyptic story. That's not its, its chief preoccupation is not with um, buildings collapsing or not having um, electricity. It's that human civilization seems to be edging toward something like it's just going more barbarous in some ways. Okay. So, um, what has, have Christians responded or engaged in this kind of trend toward decay? I think in the first 50 years after World War I, the answer was a robust yes, yes. And we could probably name some of the writers that we really esteem around this room that seem to be really engaged, also concerned with decay. But I think in the last 50 years, the answer is not as robust a yes. It may even be a no, or at best, it's a maybe. So um, there was kind of a glory era um, from probably World War I up until maybe 10 years after World War II, in which Christians seem to have dedicated themselves very vigorously toward the imaginative narrative arts. So um, we can think of C.S. Lewis. There was a group of Catholic writers, Walker Percy, Flannery O'Connor, and a few others who wrote not just esteemed novels, but novels that we still read, really excellent works. But I think in the last 50 years, that engagement has, that engagement among Christians has withdrawn. I'll speculate a little bit about that. Um, my, my first speculation is that um, American Christians invested in other places, but they did not invest very much in what I'll call high art. So, uh, American Christians in, uh, invested deeply in politics, deeply in caring for the poor, deeply in preaching, and all of these are good things, and they're all things that Christians are called to do, but they did not invest deeply in the higher arts during the last 50 years. David, uh, excuse me, James Davidson Hunter is a sociologist at the University of Virginia, he wrote a book called To Change the World, and he contrasts the last 50 to 75 years. Um, he contrasts the Jewish community's involvement in higher art and Christian involvement in the higher art. And he's like, when the Jewish community wants to moves to move somewhere, they go to New York, they go to Los Angeles, they go to the power corridor along the East Coast, and... That's where they invest time, money, energy, ability. And he said, you can see almost the exact opposite happening among Christians. They have gone away from the big cities toward the country, toward the suburbs. And so he's kind of like, their investment in high art, our investment in high art kind of mirrors that roughly. So we could probably name, if we just sat here in the last hundred years, probably 10 great Jewish novelists it'd be hard to come up with, for me, it'd be hard to come up with more than maybe three or four great Christian novelists. But if you compare just like the sheer demographic numbers of the number of Christians living in the United States to the number of Jews that are living in the United States, like the number of Christians probably, what an, I don't know, like 50 to one maybe. So as far as like strict demographics go, Christians ought to have the upper hand, but that's, or they ought to have a greater number of kind of like impressive, accomplished novelists, but the opposite is the case. And I think that's part of the reason why is there's just not been much investment there. It's not been an esteemed category for young, promising artists to invest in. Preaching, yes. Um, caring for the poor, yes. Politics, yes. But not as much in high art. 
Uh, there's a second reason, I think, why. And again, this is just kind of like a demographic reason. I think if there's a country that's most strongly associated with the novel, I'll just take a straw poll. If you associate one country with kind of like accomplishment in the art of the novel, I think there's kind of only one answer. It's England. England. The number of Christians in England has dropped pretty precipitously in the last 100 years. So, I mean, there's just not as many Christians in England writing novels. It's just kind of like a demographic fact. Okay, so returning to my theme, as I was saying, since Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy, I can think of only two what I would call really excellent novelists in the last 50 years who claim Christianity. And those are Marilyn Robinson and Wendell Berry. Marilyn Robinson and Wendell Berry. Marilyn Robinson's book, Gilead, was awarded the Pulitzer and the National Book of the Year in 2004. And Wendell Berry's fiction, while it's not as decorated publicly as Mary, um, Marilyn Robinson's is, but he has an avid, I, I hesitate to call it a cult following, but I can't think of a better phrase. But he has an avid following. And I think just on the merits of his writing, I think he's just splendid. I think he's an absolutely wonderful novelist. But it's interesting. Neither of these writers, and they're the only ones that I can think of. Perhaps you can think of somebody that I haven't. Um, and again, I'm talking about the high art novel. These are the only two novels that I can think of that can both claim greatness and also Christian. But even that part, the Christian part for Wendell Berry is a little bit, uh, is, I mean, like, is he really a Christian? It's hard. Those of you who know his work, you know the kind of like the relationship he has with Christianity is absolutely one of respect. But would he say, yes, the Apostles' Creed, I believe it top to bottom? I don't know. I don't know that he would. So both of them um, have what I would call a, a, a complicated relationship with uh, traditional Christianity. Marilyn Robinson... I think that she would say, yeah, absolutely, I'm a Christian. That's the, that's the tradition that I'm a part of. Uh, she's culturally and politically progressive on the one hand, and on the other hand, she's an avid proponent of John Calvin and the Puritans. And it's like, man, I, it's just like, I don't understand Marilyn Robinson. I do kind of understand. If you read her stuff, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Like, it makes sense that you can be like both of these at the same time. Wendell Berry, I think, would probably be better defined as a traditionalist agrarian than a Christian. But both of them share an approach to their characters that I'm going to now attempt to name and describe. So both of them, I think, acknowledge that kind of sense of decay that we've seen in the novel in the last hundred years. I think they kind of just take it for granted. I think earlier Christian writers or earlier earlier writers, full stop, used to look at that decay and they would see the novel as perhaps having a kind of like bolstering influence. It can stymie the decay. We can still do something about this. We can still like bolster the foundation. I think for Marilyn Robinson and I think for Wendell Berry, both of them are, they don't, I think they have stepped past pr the protest of decay, and I think they just accept that we live in a different sort of world, a world that is either decaying to its own ruin or it's decaying, and actually the decay is more of a morph. And I think that, I think Marilyn Robinson especially is not that worried, not terribly worried about the decay. Wendell Berry is a different story. If you know Wendell Berry, he has a, like an avid desire to preserve a sort of, that's not exactly right, let me say that better. He has an avid desire to name and to esteem a life that came before, but I think that Wendell Berry also recognizes that that life has passed. And I think it fills him with sadness, I think it fills him with remorse, but I think there's a certain... Um, inevitability of the agrarian machine 
that has come in during the last 50 to 75 years that he thinks is diminishing a way of life, a life that is a, that kind of spiritually ties the individual to um, the earth. And I think he thinks that we're losing something tremendous by losing that. But I also think that he sees it as sort of an inevitability. We can, we can quibble about that. You can argue with me if you see his work a different way. Because he's, in some ways, when I read Wendell Berry, I know exactly what I'm getting. And in some ways, I'm like, but what are you getting at? I mean, like, is this a, a preservation project? Or is this just kind of like a sociological observation and I think he's kind of midway between those two things. And I think that's kind of what I think novelists are often, it's difficult. Are you, is, um, was Fitzgerald bemoaning? That's a bad example. I think he's had like such a moral project. Um, is Cormac McCarthy bemoaning the state of civilization or just describing it? I think it's, it's both. He's doing both. So, both of these writers, as I see it, have kind of accepted the theme of decay. And I think they're both proposing a sort of heroism in the midst of that decay. And I'm going to call that heroism a heroism of faithful presence. So these characters aren't trying to change the world. They're not trying to save a culture. They're trying to be faithful within that culture and adapt to that culture. Not sell out, but adapt to this kind of new situation that they have found themselves in. In his book, Jaber Crow, Wendell Berry recounts the story of bachelor barber Jaber. Jaber, this is such a wonderful book. Jaber is kind of, he's just condemned to be lonely. And he's trapped between all of these deep, deep longings and just sort of like the practicalities of modern life. More than anything else, Jaber wonders. He wonders about everything. And he looks like an inconsequential character. He's just, he's a barber in a backwoods part of Kentucky on the surface. But there's such a, like a deep and profound nobility to his inner life that any observer that goes to his barber shop or his, his neighbor or who waves at him on the sidewalk as he's you know passing the other way would never know what kind of inside or inner life Jaber Crow has. But as the reader, we kind of we're invited into it, and he's just a delightful, like heartbreaking character. Here's a quote from Jaber. Before I say it, um, Jaber Crow, for those of you who have not read it, should read it. Those who have ever read it might have noticed that it kind of follows a similar pattern to um, Dante's Divine Comedy. And he mentions uh, the Divine Comedy obliquely here. If you could do it, I suppose, it would be a good idea to live your life in a straight line, starting, say, in the dark wood of error, and proceeding by logical steps through hell and purgatory and into heaven. Or, he's also making mention of Pilgrim's Progress, you can probably hear that also. Or, you could take King's Highway past appropriately named dangers, toils, and snares, and finally, across the river of death and enter the celestial city. But that is not the way I have done it so far. I am a pilgrim, but my pilgrimage has been wandering and unmarked. Often what looked like a straight line to me has been a circle or a doubling back. I have been in the dark wood of error many times. I have known something of a hell, purgatory, and heaven, but not always in that order. The names of many snares and dangers have been made known to, have been made known to me, but I have seen them only in looking back. Often I have not known where I was going until I was already there. I've had my share of desires and goals, but my life has come to me, or I have gone to it mainly by way of mistakes and surprises. Often I have received better than I deserved. Often my fairest hopes have rested on bad mistakes. I am an ignorant pilgrim crossing a dark valley, and yet for a long time, looking back, I have been unable to shake the feeling that I have been led. Make of that what you will. So that last line, 
I have been unable to shake the feeling that I have been led. Make of that what you will. There's this sense that I have in Wendell Berry's novels that he, I th- I'm sure that he believes in God. I think he has a very difficult time with kind of like the organizational aspect of Christianity. Um, but he still feels like this is sort of a tale. My life is a tale that is being written by someone other than myself. And it's not a story that is just accident. It's not chaos. Someone is behind it. Jaber is a faithful member of his church in Port William, yet he struggles mightily against the church as organization. Quote, I am maybe the ultimate Protestant, a man at the end of the Protestant road, for as I have read the Gospels over the years, the belief has grown in me that Christ did not come to found an organized religion, but came instead to found an unorganized one. He seems to have come to carry religion out of the temples and into the fields and sheep pastures, onto the roadsides and banks of the river, into the houses of sinners and publicans, into the town and the wilderness, toward the membership of all that is there. Whether or not Jaber is a stand-in for Wendell Berry could be debated, but I think he, I think he is a stand-in for Wendell Berry in, in many, many ways. Um, Jaber's disposition seems to me to really resonate with um, uh, Wendell Berry's concerns as articulated in his essays and his poetry. Marilyn Robinson's protagonist in Gilead is a man named Reverend John Ames. He also is a lifelong member of his church, not just member, but the pastor of his church. And he has also not ceased to wonder and wrestle about the faith. The book Gilead is a series of letters written from Reverend Ames to his son. Reverend Ames has um, had his son very late in Reverend Ames' life. So his boy is very young when I think he's probably in his 60s. So the age difference between he and his son is so sizable that he's worried that he's not going to be around when his boy is in most need of his guidance. So the book is full. It's not just a narrative about his life, but it's also full of wisdom and observations that he's hoping to pass along to his son. Quote, there are two occasions when the sacred beauty of creation becomes dazzlingly apparent and they occur together. One is when we feel our mortal insufficiency to the world and the other is when we feel the world's mortal insufficiency to us. Much of the first part of the book is Reverend Ames remembering the division or gulf between his father and his grandfather over the question of abolition. So John Ames, the main character, John Ames' grandfather was an absolute ardent abolitionist, a supporter of John Brown. If you guys remember who John Brown is, John Brown, um, John Brown just kind of forced the issue of abolition. He was, he was a radical abolitionist who I believe lived in Kansas. Kansas, I think that's right. And John Ames in the story knew John Brown as a supporter of John Brown. But his father retreats from his grandfather's hardline stance, but both men kind of calcify into these different convictions and their relationship remains deeply strained throughout their life and John John Ames' life. Maybe this is me, but I kind of read that ideological battle between grandfather and father as sort of an overlay to like kind of like the culture war of the previous 50 years. Again, that might just be me, but it does seem like Marilyn Robinson locates her book in that particular time for a particular reason. That's my suspicion. And also, slavery is just like the great wound in the United States of America. That's like, if you're going to address a social ill, that's the social ill that you have to like, you've got to address it. John Ames seems more saddened by the battle between his father and his grandfather. He thinks that the convictions of each man are important, but he chooses a different sort of life. And it's that kind of life that I'm trying to describe here that I think resonates in some ways with Wendell Berry's heroes. It's a life of what I'm calling faithful presence. So there's a timeless sort of character to the inner Christian life. 
There's a timeless char- character to following Jesus. And such a life can be recognized across history and across cultural boundaries. And that's the kind of life that both men in these very different ways I see, they're kind of trying to emulate and live that kind of life. Rather than protest too hard against the decay, they're trying to just live faithfully inside of it. It's interesting that both characters are marked by a longing, deep, deep longing. Both characters desire, both characters have wishes, and so many of their longings and wishes are unrequited. But nevertheless, they seek, perhaps more than anything else, lives of integrity. They're frustrated at the world, they want to change the world, but in some sense, they accept the world. So both authors have, and this is me moving toward conclusion, in my estimation, attempted to step beyond this sense of decay, this predominant theme of the last hundred years in novels. Do they care about the state of civilization? Absolutely. But are they hoping to preserve the embers of a decaying civilization? That answer is very complicated. In some ways, no. Wendell Berry, In some ways, yes. In some way, no. In uh, Marilyn Robinson, it doesn't seem to be a preoccupation of hers. Wendell Berry seems adamant about preserving the good things of past generations. He loathes the big business approach to farming and agrarian life. And his novels operate almost like a sort of shrine toward a life that has passed away. His protagonists seem keenly aware of decay and yet are willing to keep going, to keep believing, and to keep loving neighbors. The novel has a great capacity to be both a reflection of an age and a corrective of an age. And it operates through a sort of cooperation between the reader and the writer, a sort of cooperation of inner experience. And I think these two novelists, though they perceive, I think both of these novelists perceive that decay is only decay. But they each strive for a life that can be recognized as full of integrity across historical and cultural boundaries. That's all I have to say. Uh, Gutenberg is known for questions and answers, I presume. Yeah. Any questions or any answers? Gil. I didn't use my glasses. I have no habit. I have have not established a habit. Tim, I have a multi-part question. Okay. First part. Um, Can we delineate what qualifies as a high art novel? Um, When Tolkien writes Lord of the Rings, fantasy is not a genre. Mm-hmm. Right, he basically starts the trend. Mm-hmm. Um, would what you're talking about um, as a high art novel would that fit into that category? Would would uh, the Lord of the Rings Lord fit of the in that Rings. category, or something like C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy? Now we think of those as genre fiction, but right. at the time they're sort of yeah. I I. I think in so many ways they touch all the kind of criteria that I'm thinking of as for like a high art novel. But I, I want to say no because the world that they have invented um, is in some way like absolutely our world, but also it's not our world. It's a fantasy world in some way or another. Does that mean that it's not like achieving the same sorts of ends as like these these great novels that I'm talking about? No, I don't think so. I don't think that it's prohibited from like achieving those same sorts of ends, but it does seem like the fantasy element is just makes it something different than what I'm talking about. Is part of the criteria that has to go into it this sort of uh, Henry James sort of internal psychological life? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so... My question is, um, is there 
a tension between sort of Christian themes and that medium. That is... High art medium? The, particularly the Jamesian uh, internal psychology. Because um, I, I think that, you know, uh, there are folks in this room who have literary aspirations and would be it would some of them also embrace Christianity and they sort of are thinking well okay so how do I yeah how do I do this thing but the the constraints on that kind of project mm -hmm. as you seem to define them would be I mean it seems like there's a the fairly limited sort of way that you would go about writing that book. It would be very internal. It would be very in the head of the character. And I'm just wondering if you could sort of explore and talk about, um, you know, is there perhaps an issue between sort of the themes of Christianity and that? Do you see any reason why perhaps that has not been pursued as the... S say more about what you, it seems like you see there might be a tension. So C.S. Lewis and Tolkien are big defenders of romance, yeah. as they say. Yeah. Um, and so they write romances. And uh, part of that has to do with the idea that the romance comes from sort of the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages is this sort of flowering of Christian you know, thought and art and so on. Yeah. And in some ways, the restriction to psychological novelization um i don't know it's very it's very of the age yeah that they're sort of trying to deal with yeah now i mean i think it's i think it's clear that you can have novels that are sort of written in in that right you've yeah. talked about some of them but i'm just curious to for you to think out loud about that i'm gonna i'm gonna try to think out loud um I, th I think if the novelists, if there's two ways that a Christian novelist, I think, could think about his or her task as a novelist. One of them is, let me try my best to tell you what it feels like, what it looks like from the inside to be engaged on a life of faith or to try to grasp after a life of faith in this present world. And I think um, Graham Greene would be an example of a great novelist that takes us like deep inside the ca a character who is trying to either like preserve faith or to like gain faith. I think that a Christian novelist might see his or her task in a different way. And that way is, let me give a glimpse that this life that we are living and this world that we are on is not the only life, that there's something else. And we can see hints and glimpses of it and glimmers of it. And I would see that as um, someone who chooses, someone who sees a Christian novelist task in that way is going to gravitate toward romances, if that makes sense. I think they're both absolutely legitimate approaches. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think they're both legitimate approaches. Thank you. Yeah. There's also two, <coughs> two parts to my question, too. Um, so uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn comes yeah. to mind. Yeah. So um, especially with the subject of decay, but I mean like fully decayed, mm -hmm. <laughs> a mm -hmm. corpse, you know. Uh, yeah. So maybe comment on Solzhenitsyn. And then uh, Marilyn Robinson's, you know, Iowa, was it University of Ida Iowa yeah. Writers? Writers Conference. Yeah, uh, downstream from her, does she have effect on people that you know of that? I'm sure she does. I don't know what their names are. Okay. Um, I just wonder if any of them are producing anything. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm hopeful, I'll say this, I just don't know what their names are. And maybe they're already out there and they're already doing great work and I haven't discovered them or they're just like haven't been discovered full stop. Um, but I'm hopeful about that because I'd like to read those books. Uh, Solzhenitsyn, I, I just read a book called 
Lenin's Tomb. It's a history book by David Remnick. Have you guys ever read this book, Lenin's Tomb? This is, I cannot recommend a book of history more highly. It, was, it won the Pulitzer in 1993. And David Remnick was a reporter for I maybe the New York Times. He and his wife lived in Moscow as the, as the um, Soviet Empire fell. Um, and so it's kind of like the story of the fall of the empire from the inside. And after reading this book, it seems to me that the reason that the Soviet Union fell because of Solzhenitsyn. I mean, I'm exaggerating that a little bit, but there are two heroic figures in the book. Uh, I, can, I can never remember the name of one of them. He was a physicist who opposed the regime. What's his name, Bob? What is it? Yes. He's the great kind of living hero of the book. Solzhenitsyn is still living, but he is in New Hampshire. But in virtually every every chapter of the book, and it's a many-chaptered big book, Solzhenitsyn just is sort of looming in the background. And everyone can point back to him and say what he said about the Gulag is true. And the lives of the prisoners is true. The only reason I didn't mention him, and I did have him in, but I was like... I think more than anything, it's the Gulag ar archipelago that is responsible for the fall of the Soviet Union, in my, in my kind of like hyperbolic estimation. I could have referred to a novel like Cancer Ward or First Circle, but I don't think that they had the impact that the Gulag archipelago had. That's why I didn't mention him. But as far as like the ability to shape culture, I, I can't think of a more affecting book than that one. Good mention. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Tim, for the uh, for the wonderful talk. Yeah. Um, my question is about um, this contrast between description and correction. Yeah. Uh, so it almost sounds like you said Wendell Berry is someone who seems to be sort of ambivalent about. Uh, the purposes, the purpose of his his novels. Um, is it possible? Can I, can I change that a little bit? Please. I please. think that he is probably not ambivalent at all. I, my understanding is ambivalent. Like I kind of like it's a corrective. It's an observation. I know that it's a corrective, but also he. I think he sees it as sort of like a fait accompli. That what's happened has happened. We, we're, we can't go back. So anyway, sorry, I'm like being hyper um, specific about something. <laughs> uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm asking, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is whether uh, something can be um, a corrective in different ways. Uh -huh. Whether you could have uh, a, a corrective working on the larger social level uh -huh. and then a corrective working on the individual personal level. And it almost sounds like what these what both of these writers are doing um, is something like a corrective, but one that is meant, designed to work on the individual level. Yes. So we can't, um, there's no panacea that is going to turn society itself back around. Right. But in a sense, I mean, society is just a group of individuals. And so uh, how else can a corrective work then on the individual level, changing um, hearts and right. minds and that right. sort of thing? So um, in, in what way, if this is how they're, um, attempting in their own modest ways to correct things mm -hmm. uh, by um, uh, speaking to the individual uh, and encouraging the individual um, in his or her life of faith and persistence in the face of all this. How is that different than the types of correctives that um, uh, earlier writers proposed? And how, how were those designed to function? And was there some more... Um, was there a, a, a more of an ideal of uh, a larger scale corrective, I guess? Would be the question. I think somebody like Charles Dickens, his scope is more than just let us try to, with our novel, let us try to approach and, and um, redeem individuals. I think that he 
spends so much time describing the yellow rivers flowing through the cities because of like just the absolute disgusting wash from you know it's like all the factories that are in the city i think that he's pointing at that and he's and he's writing to parliament to do something about that i think part of the reason he has such staying power is because he both does that and he also has this incredible ability to get, get inside a character's skin um so is that is that an answer to your question, Chris? I wish I could think. I could probably think of more. You guys could probably think better than I could of other novels who seem to have kind of a broader scope. Okay, um, Theodore Dreisler. I think he moves Carrie from rural Wisconsin, and when she moves into the city, the city itself becomes a kind of character in a way. And it's a corrosive character. I and mean, I think she ends up becoming, I think she become, ends up at some point she's a prostitute. And you can see with each step along the way, you're like, she didn't have any choice. I mean, she like, she didn't want that life for herself, but each different like decision that she made just took her toward that place. And I suspect that somebody like Dreisler would say, not that Sister Carrie is, um, didn't have any agency, but I think he would say the city was a character that overpowered her, and thus, let's not just try to save Carrie. We need to address the city also. And so I think he's successful like Dickens is at like tackling both of these things at the same time. Do you think um, that might have had anything to do with uh, the different nature of the audience for the novel at that time. So obviously the novel, uh, people talk about the death of the novel, they've been talking about it for a long yeah. time. Um, the novel doesn't have the place, I mean literature itself doesn't really have the place, especially high art. Right. Uh, in today's culture, it doesn't have the cultural clout that it used to. Yeah. Um, intellectuals uh, are only known by other intellectuals yeah. and not popularly. Yeah. So um, is there a sense in which Dickens might have undertaken this slightly different uh, corrective project because he knew that he had a stage or an audience mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. And um, more recent people have not because simply uh, the, the parliament is no longer paying attention. Yeah, right, right. That's a great point. I would hold up somebody like Tom Wolfe, Bonfire of the Vanities, A Man in Full, um, and I would say, I think his aspirations are the same as Charles Dickens in some ways. He's not writing to Parliament the way that, I mean, I think, I think Dickens like saw that the line between him, his novel, and Parliament was about like that long. It was not long at all, you know. And I think that Wolfe sees that line between himself and um, the United States Congress is a much longer, more meandering line, but I still think he thinks there's a line there. And I think he's probably right. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm giving like way too much credit to our Congress that they're like doing deep dives on Tom Wolfe novels. But I, I mean, like, they read, <laughs> you know? They, they, and Tom Wolfe's books have kind of like, they put a dent in it in a way. So I think you're absolutely right about that the, the kind of readership of the novel has changed the aspirations of the novel kind of from the, bo from the ground up. It's changed what a novel can do. But I don't think it's so changed its shape that it can no longer do what somebody like Dickens was aiming to do. Yeah. Um, Hey, <laughs> I thought it was like I thought Mike was gonna mi migrate this way. No, just um, I guess my question is, you know, in reading modern literature, do you, are you still coming across decay as being the predominant trend, or are you getting the feeling that, you know, today's authors or the authors of like the last thirty or fifty years are starting to focus on something different or something new or a new approach to? Mm -hmm. I think that um, I still see decay as a pretty, I don't, I'm not going to say that it, in the last 30 years it's the predominant 
theme, but I think it's still, it's a note that people are still playing. So I'm thinking of uh, Jonathan Foster. Franz, what's that? David Foster Wallace. Jonathan. David Foster Wallace, right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and boy, David Foster Wallace is so wonderful. Oh my gosh, he's so wonderful. Um, I don't know a lot of Christians that read him because I think he got kind of tagged as postmodern or something like that because his style seems so in keeping with kind of like a postmodern kind of detritus approach. Man, he's so good. I think he's so wonderful. And I find him, like, I mean, I can't, this is like a little bit of sacrilege, incredibly hopeful, like incredibly hopeful. Like kind of like there's this sort of heartbeat underneath him that like, I, I care, I care, I care. Um, I'm thinking of jo somebody like Jonathan Franzen. If you guys have read maybe Freedom or the book that came before it, I think it was the, is it The Commitments? I can't remember. They're both delightful books. Um, and I see decay as like all over those books and it's decay that has actually entered the nuclear family. If, if that makes sense. It's not just like a Dickensian sort of decay. It's not just a decay of the manners of the great Lord Darlington's house. It's a decay that has entered the American nuclear family and it's just blowing everything up. Um, I could think of some others. So I think, well, no, I started to like kind of like talk out of my own mouth instead of as a novelist. I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. I think it's still a, a note that is still being played a lot. But I wonder when it's going to wear out. I wonder if we're going to be like decayed of decay or bored is of decay. It, do you feel like maybe other genres are starting to move in different directions? Like the, the science fiction and fantasy or the, you know, whatever genre, other genres there are out there. I don't remember at the moment. So I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, I just have no idea. I'm so unversed in that, that part of the world. I'm not against it. I just have, I just ran out of time. <laughs> ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. I like the question, though. Somebody over here? Well, just a <clears throat> comment that uh, I think Chris was talking about uh, um, a different audience. Uh, you alluded to a different uh, stage. Dickens might have seen himself as on a stage. Um, it just strikes me that uh, even though somebody like Lewis and Tolkien um, invented the fantasy genre, they, <coughs> they didn't write uh, entertainment sci-fi. Mm -hmm. It was, it's still, uh, especially Lewis's, especially, were extremely uh, cautionary about trends he saw in, in yeah. the culture. Yeah. Um, that's a lot different than the entertainment industry of today, which is not fantasy oriented, it's escapist yeah. oriented. And so the stage today is a zillion indies mm. writing and producing movies and, and um, all sorts of, type of types of art that are very escapist. Mm -hmm. And so the novelist, Christian or otherwise, who wants to say something like like you're saying, high art. Yeah. Who's gonna Who's gonna listen? Yeah. Who's gonna read it? Yeah. And so maybe the culture itself seems appears, at least to an old guy like me, kind of decayed. Mm. And um, who's gonna read the high art? Right. Right. I, I'm not saying there aren't people out there thinking those thoughts. Yeah. I, I saw President Obama carrying Marilyn Robinson's Gilead right. under, you know, under but his But what arm. about all the members of Congress who would rather read Ayn Rand or somebody like that? Because... You'd explain a lot. Because, <laughs> because they're wealth-driven. Yeah, you know. right, right. Yeah. I, I This is going to sound like it's not addressing... Your comment, Bob, but I'll swing it back around. This big truck that I'm about to drive. I remember um, Gutenberg students. N it was none of y'all, but I think it was like soon. It was a little bit before you guys. 
saying that there was no kind of monoculture in the public high schools that they had attended. Meaning, at my high school, the mo I mean, this is like it sounds like a cliche. It's so true. The quarterback of my football team and the captain of the cheerleading squad, Bo Adams and Christy McGartlin, like everyone was like, yeah, they're it. They're like, those are the people that we're all trying to be like, and we're either going to like, you know, be like them and be cool or not. And I remember Gutenberg students saying like, yeah, it's not a thing anymore. And I was like, yeah, it is, because that's just the way that human societies work. And they're like, no, it actually is not. It's just not the way that like high schools function anymore. It's kind of like um, there's not a monoculture that everybody's trying to kind of like aspire to like a similar sort of look and way of talking and way of dressing. There's like, you know, 15 different cultures. And you find your culture, and maybe there's a hierarchy within that culture, but it's not a monoculture. It's just one of 15 cultures. And I wonder if there's something, I mean, I, I, yeah, I kind of think that's probably the case in like contemporary public school life. And I think that's probably the case in like contemporary American life. There's not, there, I think there used to be something like a kind of monoculture or a sort of aristocracy that was not based, like it was not the English aristocracy, but it was something like, you know, resembled in some ways the English aristocracy and the people that were down here wanted more money so they could be like them. Um, but I don't know that that's the case anymore. It seems like it's kind of a splintered sort of society. And thus, maybe the power of the novel is confined to a certain splintered set instead of appealing to kind of like a big monoculture. But I still think that that set that it appeals to are where all the cool kids are. That was just a joke. That was kind of a joke. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Can you comment a little bit more on um, any theories you might have of why Christians have, and I've seen this as well, have as a whole moved away from high art, maybe at first accidentally, but almost now purposefully? Yeah. I, oh man, that is such a big, excellent question. I think that there has been a sort of one-to-one -one association between high art and elitism, and elitism is bad, thus high art is bad. I think that's a huge thing. Um, the elite, I mean, you can even hear it in like our political discourse, the elites in Hollywood, the elites in New York, the elites in... Um, and I think that a lot of, I think popularly spoken Christians have kind of like done that sort of correspondence. High art is like the tool of the elites to kind of coerce, you know, like shove stuff down our throat or something like that. And who's denied that like that's not been the case sometimes? Yeah, it's been the case sometimes. Um, but the book that I mentioned, James David Davidson Hunter's book, To Change the World, is great. It's, he's a sociologist by training, and he just kind of like does the diagram of how the kind of Christian approach to culture change. He's like, yeah, culture has never changed the way that, that, that contemporary Christians have kind of tried to go about it. No culture has ever changed in that fashion. So we would have been the first one, but it, it's not really working. So, and he... He doesn't spend a ton of time on this. I don't want to overrepresent it, but he's like, Jewish community knows how to do it. They're just a lot smarter how to do it. You go to like where the power is, and he doesn't think that power is. He, never mind, I'm running so far afield. You go to where culture is made and disseminated. You just, that's where you go. That's where you spend time. And that's just kind of not what's happened in the last 50 years. Christians kind of moved to the suburbs. Okay, Chris. Uh, we've we've heard you in your capacity as a professional amateur or amateur professional literary critic. I was yeah. wondering if you could um, speak a little bit in uh, as a playwriter, as yeah. an artist yourself, um, and. Uh, 
maybe talk a little bit about how uh, the theater, how this being a different medium, yeah. um, uh, affects how you think about these things, what effect these ideas uh, and the study of the novel has had on your own art yeah. and practice, and whether, because obviously theater is very much about character, very character driven yes. as well, yeah. and whether you think of yourself as um, anywhere in this lineage of uh, Christian writers who have documented decay, attempted correctives, and how you uh, go about that uh, yourself. Man, you're gonna get me like riled up. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'm like so preoccupied with this question. Um, can I turn this mic off for a second, Chris? Because I'm gonna say something. I'm like, I don't know. I, I just don't. I just want to be able to be very honest with my people. thinking that I'd like to write about is about Simone Vi, and I'm like, no one is going to go see a play about Simone Vi, are they? Is anyone going to go see a play about Simone Vi? Am I going to spend a year investing in a play that no one's going to go see? Am I going to do that? I may be being a little bit um, overly cynical, but that's, that's I kind of wrestle with that. I'm a little worried about that. Okay. The end, I just spilled my guts in front of everybody. <laughs> Thanks very much.